So I'm very pleased to be back in Tejong and also to offer my uh, birthday congratulations to Professor Zach. I want to start with, uh, in keeping with the kind of general tenure of, tenor of this uh, conference, I want to start with something which uh, everybody here knows very well, which is the uh, Del, Del Pezzo uh, surfaces and, and nine, eight, seven, six. <coughs> So uh, we start off with P2, and we take the third Veronese embedding, and that takes us into P, that takes us into a surface S9 in P9, and uh, then we can do this, uh, we can choose a point, a point P in it, and make a linear projection. So I'm saying something which I'm sure everybody here knows very well. Um, I'm especially interested in this case, S6. To, whoops, to S5. And then uh, I don't have, haven't left myself enough room, S4 to S3. So I'll explain these last. This is just the cubic surface with its famous configuration of 27 lines. This is an uh, intersection of two quadrics with its uh, no, less, no less famous collection of 16 planes. So I want to explain this. I want to explain particularly how you can think about this, this case. But at the same time, I, want to ex uh, I, want, I really want to talk about three folds. So uh, uh, what, about, uh, what about three folds containing this? Threefold, three folds containing some of these as uh, hyper, hyper sections, hyperplane sections. So there's something here which is, uh, you know, in some ways everybody should know just as well as they know the Del Pezzo surfaces, which is I can take P3. And I can take the second Veronese embedding of P3. So I can take uh, B2 of P3, and that's mapping to a variety here, let me say Y8. And, uh, you know, it's not completely true that the hyperplane section of Y8 is the S8. Let me explain that a bit later. However, so. Uh, you know, what's, what, the, what is the hyperplane section of Y8? I take up Y8 by a hyperplane. Well, it means I'm taking the, y, uh, the P3, and inside there I'm taking a quadric hypersurface, which everybody knows is P1 plus P1. And then I'm embedding this. So this has a, you know, S8 prime as a hyperplane section. So this, uh, this is P1 cross P1, embedded in P8 as um, by the linear system 2, 2, by the anti-canonical system of P1 cross P1. And so this is a sort of brother of this guy. They're not the same variety. This one is, this one is F1, and this one is F0. However, if I project down, if I, if I take this Y8 down and I project them down here, I get a Y7, and then a Y6, and then a, and so on. This goes all the way down to Y3. So if I actually start from this Y8, then I get this cascade of varieties, and they have as their hyperplane sections. I mean, except for this little one uh, at the top, which is exceptional, then the hyperplane, the general hyperplane section of these guys are these guys. This is just the general hypersurface, so there's an S7 in there, a hyperplane, maybe I'll write it here, S7 there, hyperplane section of the Y7, and that's what you get if you take P1 cross P1 and blow up in one point, and that's the same thing as if you take P2 and blow up in two points. So, um, uh, 
you know, I can do this for surfaces, and if, if I did this just for surfaces, I'd get S6, S5, <coughs> uh, S4, S3, and uh, you know, basically it's the same as the S3, uh, it's the same as the previous cascade, and not especially interesting. So there are some completely specific threefold things that are happening here. <coughs> so namely, uh, you know, for example, let's go at the bottom. This is a threefold in P4. Oh, okay, 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 they're not in. This is in P9. This one's in P10. <coughs> and so on. The surfaces would be in, in these spaces. Guy at the blackboard is always blind. So, anyway, this guy's in P4, and he's a cubic hypersurface. But he's not any old cubic hypersurface because he contains a number of planes. So by construction here, it contains the uh, exceptional planes that are blown up from here. <coughs> so I want to talk about how to do the inverse operation here, which is called unprojection. And I'm especially interested in, uh, in this guy here. <coughs> So I'm going to start off by, uh, by explaining this in very, very simple terms from the, uh, from the case of the cubic hypersurface. So let me, uh, so that was a little introduction. I want to explain the specifically threefold things that happen. So this, uh, so starting from this guy Y6, this Y6 is, contains two planes, and the two planes intersect in a point, which is a singular point of the Y6, which is normally over the Y6. And then this guy, uh, if we're really lucky, has three planes that meet two by two in points, and uh, they, 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 the, the, the points form a triangle, points of a triangle, and the plane, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, the tremendous transformation of the plane that's happened there as well. So, you know, lots of interesting things happening here, and you don't really see them on the Del Pezzo surface, you see them immediately on the three part. So let's look at uh, S3 and P3, and containing a line. <coughs> I want to explain how I can go from that to the S4. And of course you all know this perfectly well. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the projection of, if I take intersection of two quadrics and take a point on it, I project down, then of course I get just the ordinary linear projection, I get down a minus one curve, and the opposite operation is the uh, Castle over contractibility criteria. Right. But let me do this, I want to do this sort of more explicitly to see the algebra and the geometry involved here. So, you know, this S3 is a hypersurface, and so if L is, for example, you know, X, Y, Z, T, maybe L is given by X equals to one equals zero, then uh, the S3 is necessarily given by A x plus B y equals zero. Right, and who are these A and B? Well, they're some, some quadratics in the variables. So they're just some quadratic forms in these variables. <coughs> so if I do that, you can say, well, you know, this is a kind of, this is one of these things where I can see a failure of unique factorization. I can see something there that has two different factorizations. So I can say, hey, B2, the, the, let me just write B. B over X is minus A over Y. So, you know, homogeneous, what, what is this? This is homogeneous of de degree two, this one's homogeneous of degree one. So this is like a linear form. with pole on L. Right, so, so if I think of this, if I, uh, I can't think of this, I'm not allowed to think of this as a rational function, I'm also not, so it's sort of a, a section of OS3 of 1, where I'm just using ordinary notation for the uh, sheaves, the uh, character sheaves on P3, and then with poles on 1. So this is bastard notation. Uh, yeah? However, I can, if, suppose I just say, right, this guy's called S. And so now I take 
this one is sort of naturally homogeneous of degree one. So let's take P4 with the coordinates x, y, z, t, and the new guy S. And inside there, let's look at uh, S, x equals B and S, y equals minus A. Right? And this is, this is a uh, uh, complete intersection of two quadrics. And it's uh, certainly non-singular at P. So P is the new point, 0, 0, 1. So this is, so to speak, PS. S is the only non-zero guy. Right. So as far as, as, far as this is concerned, the, uh, the x and the y are where, uh, are where these functions have poles. So I can think of the s as, uh, the, s as the guy that takes the value, um, s takes the value infinity at l. So this is really the point zero, zero, 001. So, you know, when you do projective geometry, the whole point of projective geometry is you can take a single point and throw it into infinity. Right, so here I'm, t I'm taking the line and throwing it out to infinity. So, um, so, and if A and B are general, this is uh, non-singular. Right, so uh, also AB, uh, AB general here. So this would have, uh, if A equals B equals zero has no points on L, so this means these four guys, A, X, B, and Y, have no common points, then, um, then S is uh, everywhere a generator of this sheaf. And then uh, the, morphism, the, the S maps to T, so this is, a, this is given by X, Y, Z, T maps to X, Y, Z, T, and S. This is a morphism, right? Because at every point, one of these ratios is defined. Okay, and so that—that's how you go from S3 to S4. This is called an unprojection, right? Because it's uh, the inverse of a projection. <coughs> So now, uh, what about if I, what about uh, what about y three maps to y four? Can I do the same trick there? Well, this business here of passing from a hypersurface given by one equation like this to uh, a complete intersection given by two equations like this, basically. Uh, the algebra of, this, of, this, of these equations don't care at all about whether or not A and B have common zeros. So for the, for the algebra of uh, you know, X A plus B, We don't need uh, and if y three is a threefold containing plane, then we can't have we can't have no simple. Right. So if I if I have this, uh, if now if now y three if y three is in P four, and I've got an equation of this form, then certainly where x equals y equals a two equals b two, in general there will be four points on the plane x equals y equals zero. Then I will have nodes. So uh, not only don't we need this thing, we can never have it if we're in three folds. So that's what so that, that's why I want to go from the surfaces up to threefold. Some some aspects of this geometry just not going to appear if we only if we restrict ourselves only to surfaces. 
Right, so, um, what do I want to say? So anyway, that was a very easy introduction to the ideas. So, uh, um, so I mean, very general theorem. is if, uh, if uh, D in X, let me say, I'm really thinking of graded rings, but let me say in P, N, if uh, they're both projectively Gorenstein and um, K, X, minus KD is positive, then there exists uh, there exists uh, a new variety um, Y for the unprojection of D where and a morphism and a rational map um, X maps to Y uh, contracting D to a point. Okay, so uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to go into the theorem and the proofs of the theorem. And uh, uh, when I say this Y is a, a new projective variety, that is true. However, he's now in a weighted projective space. I'll explain later. So, so please just trust me. There's a theorem. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What do you mean by Kx minus Kd? So, projectively Gorenstein. Yeah, means K Kd is Ox of... Oh, uh, uh, you, mean, you mean I've got the sign wrong? So, in the, in the case I was doing, this one was minus 1 and this one is minus 2. Right? Oh, minus 1 minus minus 2 is positive. Right? So uh, this is degree S. Right, over there I made this fuss about the element S I defined being of degree 1. Right. So this is a theorem which in one form is due to Christin, uh, uh, Christin and Miller uh, around 1980 and to Papadakis and Reed. In any case, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to explain this theorem, just uh, believe me. Um, uh, and this theorem here does not make any assumptions about D and X at all, except that X is of co-dimension 1. They're projectively Gorenstein and co-dimension 1. Right, so this, this map here, X to Y, well, it's a morphism where D is a Cartier divisor and it contracts D. However, D, D doesn't have to be a Cartier divisor even at its generic point. <coughs> okay, so I want to explain what happens to, to so S5. This S5 goes to S6, and this, uh, the Y6 comes from S5, uh, Y5. Right? So uh, a del pencil surface of degree five has on it, uh, you know, a little circle of, uh, of, uh, of lines. I choose one of them, and I can contract it to a point, and then I get the del pencil surface of degree six. <coughs> right, and then I want to do the same here with this y. And the point is there are going to be two quite different solutions for this problem. And uh, so I'm going this one here. So. So uh, both S5 in P5 and Y5 in P6 are projectively Berenstein varieties. And it follows, this is a theorem of Buxbaum and Eisenberg, that they're they're, they're 
So in other words, there exists a skew matrix. In this case, it's 5 by 5 uh, in, uh, of linear forms. So I'm, I've got, there's a general theorem here saying, saying that there's always a, a skew 2K, 2K plus 1 by 2K plus 1 matrix and uh, with entries homogeneous forms here so that the 2 by 2 minus are homogeneous. However, here they're all linear forms. Right, so that, uh, so that with entries linear forms in the PN so that, um, say, l l I'm mainly interested in the Y. Y, y 5 is uh, given by Fathian I equals zero. I equals zero. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so here's my matrix. M, he's called M12, M13, M14, M15, M23. Right, so the zeros down the diagonal and the skew symmetric interest there, and I'm not going to write them down. That's a five by five matrix. So, so that and the Pathian I are given by uh, M J K M L M minus M J L M K M plus M. Okay, so uh, you know the first of these guys is him times him minus him times him plus him times him. Yes. So I'm being pedestrian about this. Uh, deter these are you know basically what I have in mind is that most of you know what two by two minus are. So think of a two by two minor there, and a paffian is just a bit more than that. Paffian is this times this minus this times this plus this times this. When you've done this a little bit, you get used to it, and it's just like calculating two by two minus. Right. So, um, so here, the thing I've done is I've written down five equations. <coughs> so, this is five equations with five decisions. And uh, what, what it really looks like is here is so so I have a, here are, here are my five equations, five patterns. Here's the matrix M, and uh, here's the. So this is the thing I'm writing down here is the projective resolution of R. In geometric terms, in geometry, this means that y plus five are linear sections of Grassmannian two five. Okay, so Grassmannian two five. I have a vector space V, so this is C five. And uh, Grassmannian of 2, 5, this is uh, two planes, P and V. And I'm doing the flipper embedding of this. Grassmannian 2, 5 embeds into P of wedge 10, of wedge 2. So this is P9. Or I can think of the affine Grassmannian being inside wedge 2 of V5. Right, this is um, 
the, the primitive tenses. So the, te the, guys, the guys of the form, uh, you know, um, V1 wedge V2. So this is a vector space. A general element in this vector space is a linear combination of these guys. The ones that can be written just like this are the primitive ones, and that's the flipper of money with the best money. Okay, so how can Y5 contain play? So how can how can Grassmannian uh, 2-5 contain the linear source? The same, the same question. So, uh, you know, many people know the answer for Grassmannian 2-4. If I take Grassmannian 2-4, right, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, the lines in P3. So how can I find, uh, this is, of course, the Klein quadrant. There are these two, two different families of linear subspaces on this Grassmannian. So how do I find a linear subspace in there? There are two solutions. I can choose a point and take all the lines through that point, or I can choose a plane and take all the lines in that plane. Right, so answer. So there are two different solutions. One, for all V in V, I can take V wedge V. Yes, and so this is, this is a, a four plane contained in uh, affine grass map. Yeah, so uh, because, because V is in V, when I do wedge V, wedge v I, I'm seeing the other four linearly independent vectors there. That makes a linear subspace there. Right, or uh, for all three planes, um, you know, C3 contained in V, I have Grassmannian 2, 3 contained in um, Grassmannian 2, 5. Yeah, so this guy here depends on the choice of one vector. I choose one vector and then I get uh, this. Uh, so this is, of course, a P3 contained in, uh, P, uh, contained in Grassmannian 2, 5. And this is, uh, so to speak, the dual construction. This is a copy of P2 contained in the same. Right? So, uh, uh, as I said, everybody knows this construction already for the Grassmannian 2 4, the line, line geometry in P3, uh, and this is just the same result here. <coughs> right, so uh, um, this. Theorem about um, the theorem about unprojection says so. If I take if I take y five, so this is Grassmannian two five intersect a. Um, so uh, let's just say what the dimensions are here. This is two times three, so this is six dimensional. He's in P9 in co-dimension 3. So I want, to, I want to cut this down to a threefold. So I want this to be uh, in P6. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is um, Grassmannian intersect three hyperplanes HI in the Plicker space. <coughs> yes? And I, and, I, and I try to force it to contain a, 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 two, a P2, linear, a linearly embedded P2, there are two solutions. So the, so the two solutions are called Tom and Jerry. 
uh, <coughs> they're cartoon characters, as I think everybody knows. And so, uh, you know, uh, Tom is uh, fatter than Jerry and comes out more often. So uh, I'll explain how to get those lines. So, so then there's a, a P2 inside my 3. So the, why, why is uh, this is Y5? It's three-dimensional. And, uh, you know, this is uh, exactly when I took a cubic hypersurface and I forced it to contain a plane, then the cubic hypersurface picked up a number of nodes, completely inevitably. This uh, Y3, in general, has two nodes. And it's unprojection. It's unprojection. So in, in general, I'm, uh, uh, I'll explain how to do this in equations. It's on projection is um, uh, the flag variety. So it's um, flag variety. So this is uh, P2, P2 cross P2 intersect hyperplane. In so this is P2, P2 in its segue embedding. And then I insect with a plane. Right? And this one here is uh, P2 in Y3, Y3 in general has three nodes, three ordinary double points, and it's on projection. I think lots of people will be able to guess this. P1 cross P1. This border is actually pretty tedious. So let me uh, let me explain how to go back. Let me explain how to go back. I've got some free work. coordinates. If, the, if I've got three coordinates on xi and three coordinates on yj, I take the products of them and then I get these mij and then here I write down uh, 2 by 2 minus equals zero. Okay, so what's it mean to make the projection? So I'm, I'm, I'm mapping this now. It's not y, it's into some z in P7. And that's containing the exceptional locus that's going to contain P3. So what are the equations defining Z? So what I do is, let's think of the point P. Let's take the point P. Let's suppose that P is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Then of all these guys here, uh, this one here is not 0 at P, whereas the others are all zero there, right? So, so these 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 four guys here are are, are, are really coordinate project uh, homogeneous coordinates on the tangent space P three. The M one and the other guys vanish at least twice at the point, right? And so, uh, let me rewrite this as uh, blank B C D E F G H I same matrix. <clears throat> right? Then I say what we have to do is 
uh, rewrites these equations. So the, all, the equations here not involving M11, rewrite them as Pfaffians. And uh, if you think about it for a little while, you'll, you'll get out B, C, D, G, um, E, F, H, I, 0, 0. <coughs> right. So this set of equations here, 2 by 2 minus of this array is equal to the, two by, the 4 by 4 Pfaffians of this matrix, this scheme matrix. Okay. So, uh, so you know, what am I seeing? I'm seeing B. I may, may, may very well have written it down wrong. wrong. Okay. B H minus C E. Okay. So I should have written down I H. Right. Now, what have I got now? This is B I. Okay. Uh, and, anyway, I mean, you get you get there eventually. It's, uh, so, uh, what am I seeing here? D F. I don't want to see D and I D. I don't want to see D. Uh, I want to say D H equals G E. So I want to put E and G there. D G E is D H. And, um, Is that is this right now? So if I do I do B F minus C D plus that, and then I do you know things like D H minus B. Okay, I, I think this is right. Anyway, you can you can uh, believe me. And so this is a POM matrix. POM one. And what is it that's POM about it? So. If you take these six entries, so choose one. Six entries not in that row. Uh, are contained in uh, third dimension four complete insertion. Okay. So, you know, the, the, what I'm doing here is really very, very simple. Right, I'm saying I've got the matrix given by the 2 by 2 minus here. Right, I separate out the guys into the equations that involve this, this, uh, this variable uh, M11 and the ones that don't involve him. Right, and so all the ones that don't involve him necessarily, um, necessarily involve the, these guys here. So I can rewrite the equations like this. Now I say if E, uh, so E equals F equals H equals I equals zero, this is certainly a co-dimension for complete intersection ideal, then uh, the matrix has rank less than or equal to two. Right, it has rank less than or equal to two because you know there's only this this row and this column are non-zero, and so the only way of getting a, a minor a non-zero minor is by taking a product there. Okay. So this is uh, <coughs> so I've, I've got a I've got a Grassmannian. I'm trying to force it to contain some linear subspace. Linear subspace will definitely be cut, in, will be an intersection with uh, um, linear, uh, linear spaces, so it'll be, a, it'll be given by a co-dimension 4 ideal. How do I get a co-dimension 4 ideal? How do I say zero, being 0 on the co-dimension 4 ideal forces all the minus to be 0? Well, this is one solution. Right, and Jerry is... Uh, very similar. Uh, 
and similar but different, so I'm going to write down Jerry 1 and 2. So I'm going to write down T, uh, if I get, I hope I get this right, Z1, Z1, Sorry, Z1, Z2, Z2, uh, Z3, 0, 0, uh, 1, 1, 2, so Y3, minus 1. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing down the matrix and I'm saying, right, I choose this element. That's the 1, 2 element. This is a 5 by 5 ski symmetric matrix. I choose this one element, and I say, I want you guys here, so the seven elements in rows and column, row and column 1 and 2, form, uh, belong to, they don't necessarily generate, belong to a per uh, dimension 4. Section. Right now, uh, you know, my favorite way of writing down P1 cross P1 cross P1 is uh, like this. I, I'm going to, so, uh, you know, uh, let, let me, I've got, you know, I've got coordinates U1, U2, V1, V2, W1, W2 here. And so what we do is we write down a little Q. Uh, on the cube we put, so this, the guy which is U1, U, uh, U1, V1, uh, U1, V1, W1, I call X. And then all the guys that have exactly one of these, uh, you know, U1, U2, V2, I call, uh, I call Y3, Y2, Y1. So these are, as far as the, this corner of the cube is concerned, uh, there are three guys that are one away from it. Right? And then I call these ones Z1, Z3, Z2, and I call this T. And then I say 2 by 2 minus of this array. Right? So this is nine equations. They define, define P1 cross P1. Right, and if I say, right, and I'm going to separate them into the guys that involve X and the ones that don't involve X, the ones that involve X are X times T equals something, X times Z, Z1, Zi equals, you know, Yi times Yj. Um. Right, that's four equations x t equals something and x times the z's or something, and then the remaining equations are five equations, and they've got to form, uh, they've got to be given by uh, a 2 by 2 minus. So I have things like t y 3 equals z1 z2, and t y 2 equals uh, you know, z1 whatever it is, z1 z3. If you figure it out, it'll, uh, it'll all work out. Okay? So, uh, you know, this is I mean, this is basically a simple story. If you want to find, you know, here's my S6, which is del petso 6. And this, it's got the projection to S5, which is the famous del petso substitute of 5. If you want to extend this one, there's a unique, uh, you know, if you want to extend it smoothly, uh, there's, a, there's a unique way of doing this. This goes to Y5, and this is a, the, this space is unobstructed. Right, so all the Y5s extending the S5 just form a linear space. Right, whereas here there are two different solutions. This is contained in something which goes up to P2 cross P2, and this is also contained in P1 cross P1. Right, and you can detect this already on the level of Y5 forced to contain a plane. Yes? <coughs> okay, so, um, uh, I mean, this is sort of basically uh, all uh, elementary stuff. It's not at all difficult to justify. I want to go on now to do uh, general 
Murray theory for Q Farm and Sweetpot. So it's a sort of change of subject, but it's really explaining why I'm interested in this uh, sort of basically rather easy construction. So Q Farm and Sweetpot. So this is, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit beyond the scope of this conference. This is, uh, you know, these uh, varieties contained in <coughs> weighted projective space usually. So let me just give the example um, x seven in p one 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 two three. Right. So this is. Uh, uh, so why is this finer? It's finer because. Kx is minus one minus one minus two minus one minus two minus three plus <coughs> maybe I should have started off by saying uh, who who is this? So this is uh, polynomial ring K of x1, x2, x3, y1, y, and z of degrees one, 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 two, three, and I'm just taking the product. That's the weight of projective space. Or I divide out by a certain, well, this is a general, general weighted equation. Right. And there are uh, 95 such hypersurfaces. <coughs> Uh, so you know this has also uh, this has only uh, terminal or default points. So you know, the orbit, for example, is a third of one 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 two. If I stand at this point, then uh, you know z z squared times one of the x's is non-zero. That can be in the equation there. So this guy here can be eliminated locally at z. Right, and then what's left is a third of one one two. Okay, and so this is an, an object of the Murray category, right? And then we can study co-dimension two, co-dimension three. These are all fafians. These are all five by five fafians. Right, and then co-dimension four. So. Uh, Maybe I should uh, cut this fairly short because I'm supposed to stop. <coughs> so, uh, uh, a graduate student of mine called Salma Altinok about 10 years ago. Uh, so, wrote down 142 candidates. This is uh, so. These are three folds. These are in these are in codimension four. Right. So the X has a variety of similarities, a, a variety of orbifold points. Uh, I still can't get can't forget the idea that orbifold points are singular as schemes. Nowadays, you're supposed to think of them as non-singular as points of stacks. Uh, <coughs> so. Uh, so, for example, one of these would be W contained in P 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 6, 8, 9, 3 times a half of 1, 1, 1, and um, 1 fifth of 1, 1, 4, and uh, 1 eighth, at this point here, 1 eighth of 1, 2, 5. Right, so these are the, these are the, these are the terminal overfold points. This is something to do with Murray theory and uh, uh, three three dimensional uh, varieties. What what this means is this this W is defined by defined by nine equations with sixteen. This is yes. Right. So basically, we don't know we 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 don't have any sure we don't have any. 
any surefire method of constructing y, of constructing y. Uh, however, uh, but uh, W has um, a projection, uh, you know, a candidate W. We don't, we don't know that he exists, so he's only a candidate for a variety. Candidate W has a projection of type 1, I'll explain what this means, to uh, co-dimension 3 variety. Per dimension three factor. And then it can be constructed. I'm, I'm going to have to leave this. Can be constructed as uh, Tom or Jerry on um, projection in several different ways. And so this gives, uh, this gives rise to several different families of W, all of them crazy smooth. So we don't need these overfold points. Crazy smooth, but with different Betty numbers. With different uh, Betty numbers, B3. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you know this guy here is going to be defined by nine equations. I say that he's crazy smooth at that point eight. So there's this point P eight. So you know, I need to give put names to these variables. So I call them x, y, z, t, u one, u two, and v, and w. So this is the point PW. This is the place where W is the only guy that's not zero. Right? And there are locally four equations of the form W times uh, the other variables. W times Y equals W times T equals W times U2 equals and W times uh, V. Right. So I'm writing down just these terms. This means that if I differentiate with respect to y, t, u2, and v, and then set w equals 1, I get a non-zero term. So these are defining a non-singular point. So if I, take, if I take not the proj of the ring, but spec of the ring, and put w equals 1, then I will see a non-singular codimension for complete intersection near that. And then if I take out account of the group action, I'll see this quotient of that. Right? So um, there are, as I said, 142 candidates. Of these, 116 have candidate projections like this. Usually the candidates can be constructed using either a Tom or a Jerry in several different ways. So I could do this with different, I could do this structure with different rows or different columns. And so there's about 300 calculations, 300 different constructions of these W. Right. And in every case, every case without exception of the 116 for which the candidate type 1 on projection exists, there exists at least one Tom and at least one Jerry. And they give here, the thing I'm saying here, they, they construct for me different families of quasi-smooth W's, uh, uh, quasi-smooth W's here, and they have different Betty numbers. So one and the same Hilbert scheme contains two different things. So well, you know, the, the reason they contain different Betty numbers is exactly the same as here. So uh, I told you, my, uh, my Y6, my Y5, containing a plane, has either two nodes, if he's a Tom, or three nodes, if he's a Jerry. Right, so when you make when you make this unprojection, first of all you have to make a small a small extraction from this node and then contract the resulting plane. And uh, so the number of nodes here 
affects the Betty number of the, fi of the final W. Sorry, Miles. Yes. You say candidates, but then you say that you can construct them by your project. Yes. So do they, so they exist or not? They, they do exist. Yes. They do exist. Usually three or four different kinds. In each, in, for each candidate, usually there are three or four different families of writers and they have different topology. Ah, so you call candidates, but they actually do exist. Well, you know, uh, I, I call them candidates because I'm a mathematician. At the beginning I start off saying this might exist, and then afterwards I, I, I prove that it does exist. For the candidates. Okay. Yeah, yes, for the candidates, that's right. So, you know, there are, uh, this, uh, these uh, weighted GQ final hypersurfaces, there are about, uh, there are two, we know, we know maybe, you know, for sure about 500 of them, right? It's probably there are maybe 2,000. Yeah, of course, this was, you cannot prove that this construction are all the, all the Hilbert scheme, of course. Maybe there are other components you cannot do that. Well, you know, there are certainly components of the Hilbert scheme that contain only badly singular varieties. Mm. Uh, so that's, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, they, we're, we're hoping, you know, this is the beginning, of, this is the beginning of a long theory. I mean, you know, we have a database that contains all our results. So, so you know, there are, we start off with something like 10,000 candidates for these. Right? And we've done all the co-dimension two, co-dimension one, two, three, four cases, right? And also birational, you know, what are the possible birational sequences of birational transformations between these? You know, which is also a big story. Um, and you know, our future generations will uh, have to patch up the details. I mean, uh, I'm not. I'm only going to be around for another ten years or so. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.